Our New Testament reading comes from Matthew chapter 21, starting at the first verse. Let us listen together for God's word. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we are entering familiar territory, focusing on stories that we hear each year, stories that are such a central part of how we understand ourselves as Christians. And so we pray that as we confront these familiar stories, that you might still speak to us in new ways by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I grew up in Southern California, and once my family took the long trip up the coast to visit San Francisco. And so we did the normal things there, one of which is to visit Fisherman's Wharf. It's probably San Francisco's most famous pier. It's a pier just full of shops and and outdoor uh, performers and caricature artists and all the sorts of things you might expect to see at a place like that. In my memory, there was one store that stood out to me in particular, and it was called, and I had to look it up online, it still exists, but I didn't remember what it was called. It's called Lefties, the left-hand store. And I remember, I'm right-handed. But I remember walking in as a kid and just being amazed at all of the things that were there tailored for left-handed people. As a child, I had never thought the the degree to which left-handed people are inconvenienced in this life. How many of you are left-handed, if you don't mind raising your left hands? So we have have a fair number. In in the the world's population, human population, roughly 8 to 12 percent, I think, of of the population is left-handed. But in this store, they had things like scissors and kitchen utensils, the sort of things you might expect to see in a left-handed store. They had garden tools that were were geared for left-handers, but other things that I I wouldn't have expected. They had leather portfolios when you open them up and the paper is on the left-hand side instead of the right, which makes so much sense. They had can openers, so instead of twisting with your right hand to open a can, you twist it with your left hand. Watches with the knob on the right side, rather the left side of the watch, so that if you're wearing it on the opposite side, you can easily change the time. And coffee mugs with a handle on the left. If you ever notice a coffee mug with a print on it, you hold it with your right hand, that nice picture is staring you right in the face. But if you hold it with your left hand, you're looking at the blank side. So they have coffee mugs with the picture on the opposite side. We live in a right-handed world. Cameras have the button on the right side for people to take pictures. Most musical instruments, especially stringed instruments, are designed for right-handers. If you've ever used a circular saw, they are made for right-handed people. And if you are left-handed, you are out of luck. and You have to use your non-dominant hand, which sounds dangerous to me. (laughs) It's probably dangerous anyways. When I was in seminary, we had a lecture hall with little flip-up desks. And and, and they came up from one side. And if you're left-handed, you got to choose from about six desks that had the desk top on the left-hand side. We, we talk about, uh, for those of you who are like me and can't dance, we have two left feet, right? So there's a, there's a connotation of clumsiness. Most languages, ours does not, but most languages have an expression that, that literally uh, is to have two left hands, which is to be clumsy. We might say we're all thumbs or something like that, but in most languages, it's to have two left hands. In Latin, the word for left is sinister, and in French, the word for left is gauche, These words that come to our language and take on very negative connotations have to do with the left-handed side. We live in a right-handed world. 
The title of my sermon is Jesus Was Left-Handed. You probably guessed, or at least you probably hoped, that I was not going to say that Jesus' dominant hand was his left hand. I mean something else entirely. The pastor and theologian Robert Capon would talk about God's power in terms of right-handed power and left-handed power. And when he talks about power in this way, it still is very much true that we live in a right-handed world. Here's how he defines and describes right-handed power. Direct straight-line power does, of course, have many uses. With it, you can lift the spaghetti from the plate to your mouth, wipe the sauce off your slacks, carry them to the dry cleaners, and perhaps even make enough money to ransom them back. Indeed, straight-line power, which he describes as use the force you need to get the result you want, is responsible for almost everything that happens in the world. And the beauty of it is, it works. From removing dust with a cloth to removing your enemy with a 45, it achieves its ends in sensible, effective, easily understood ways. That is right-hand power. That is the way that everything happens in the world, as he said. But left-handed power is something very different. And here's how he describes left-handed power. Left-handed power is power that looks for all the world like weakness. More than that. It is guaranteed to stop no determined evildoers whatsoever. It might, of course, touch and soften their hearts, but then again, it might not. It certainly didn't for Jesus. And if you decide to use it, you should be quite clear that it probably won't for you either. That is left-handed power. We live in a right-handed world. We live in a world where power works in that straight-line fashion where if you want to get something done, you do it. And frankly, we wouldn't survive if we couldn't live our lives in that way. But the power that Jesus demonstrated, the power that God demonstrated through Jesus is something very different. And if we confuse it with the kind of power that dominates our lives, we run the risk of misunderstanding Jesus altogether. And so to see how left-handed power is at work in this passage, we have to understand how strange this scene really is. It centers in Jerusalem. This is where it's taking place. And Jerusalem is a very significant city for Jews. Remember that Jesus' ministry took place, for the most part, out in the country, far from the city, the, in the metropolitan area, out in the suburbs. Jesus was, was traveling around to these small towns, stirring up controversy, but he had, for the most part, avoided the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center, the population center, but it was also the political headquarters, and it was the religious epicenter. So all of the, the important religious things that happened, all of the important political things that happened, centered in Jerusalem. That's where it all took place. And so for Jesus, who was traveling around stirring up controversy, that was also for him the center of opposition. It was, so to speak, the heart of the beast for Jesus. And Jesus knew where he would end up. Jesus knew that his ministry was leading him to Jerusalem. Which is to say, Jesus knew that his ministry was leading him to confrontation. A confrontation that he knew would take his life. In Luke's Gospel, right in the middle, Luke tells us that Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. There's a turn in Jesus' ministry where he knows that things have, have begun to move in that direction because he knows how all of this is going to end. And it's interesting, knowing this, that Jesus doesn't sneak into Jerusalem through a back gate. Jesus doesn't find a quiet way in to try to preserve his anonymity for a, a few more precious hours. Instead, he makes a public entrance, which we call the triumphal entry. You probably remember it wasn't long ago. The Seattle Seahawks won the Super Bowl in February. And they had a parade, as all teams do, in, the, in their, the center of their city. And I remember hearing on the news that an extraordinary number of people had turned out for this parade. It turns out, estimates are, that, it was, that there were more than 700,000 people lining the streets of Seattle. Do you know what the population of Seattle is? 635,000. More people turned out to that parade than actually live in the city limits of Seattle. It was a victory parade because they had won the Super Bowl, their first in a long time. But victory parades are nothing new. There's a famous picture of the Allied troops after they had taken, retaken the city of Paris during World War II, where the troops are parading down the Champs Elysees. They've just gone under the Arc de Triomphe. This is one of the most memorable in recent memory victory parades. But again, they go even farther back. As early as 500 B.C., 
we see evidence of a practice in the Roman Empire that's called a triumph. It's a formal event that is planned for a general returning from battle, returning from a successful military campaign. And this general would petition the Senate, the Roman Senate, for permission to hold a triumph. And this triumph was a parade. People would lie in the streets and the general would wear a, a, a laurel crown and would ride on a chariot, a horse-driven chariot, into the city to cheers. And people would cheer the general and they would cheer the army. What's interesting about a triumph like that, <clears throat> excuse me, even, <clears throat> even the parade when the Allied troops retook Paris, it, these parades are not mere celebrations. They're not mere parades. They are political statements. They are deeply political statements. For a Roman general, it was an opportunity to make his name known, perhaps because he had further political ambitions. Just 200 years before Jesus, a man named Judas Maccabeus, a Jew, paraded into Jerusalem. He had led a successful revolt against the Greeks who dominated Jerusalem. And, and Judas Maccabeus, after, after conquering the pagan armies, led his troops into Jerusalem, a triumphal entry, and the people waved palm branches of all things as he entered the city. And, and Judas Maccabeus ushered in a dynasty that would last about a hundred years, and it was the last time that the Jews had political autonomy before the Romans would come in and conquer the, the, the Jewish armies. It looks very much like the triumphal entry of Jesus with the palm branches and the celebrations, but there is something very different about Jesus' entry on this day. Something very different about the kind of king that Jesus proclaims himself to be by entering Jerusalem in the way that he did. But the first thing for us to recognize is that Jesus in doing this is being self-consciously political. In recent years, in the last couple of decades probably, scholars of Christianity have begun to reawaken to the idea that Jesus' ministry was many things, but it was also profoundly political. For a long time, Christians had looked at Jesus and said, he, he's concerned about, about heaven, he's concerned about otherworldly things, about our salvation, but he's really not involved in politics. He's really not interested in the politics of this world. Now, if any other person had ridden into Jerusalem at, with, with such fanfare, it would be an obvious political statement, but somehow we've been able to look at Jesus and say, no, he wasn't being political at all. Remember back in 2010 or 11, when, when there was already a lot of talk about the 2012 presidential campaign, Sarah Palin took a bus tour around the country. And there was wild speculation the entire time she was on this tour about whether or not she was going to run for president. It was an overtly political um, uh, thing that she did. Now, she ended up not running, as we all know, and she wasn't explicitly stating the purpose, th that she wasn't telling us that that was why she was doing it, but just for her to do it just for her to undertake an action like that, immediately gets the political wheels turning. It's the very same thing for Jesus. For him to ride into Jerusalem is to get the political wheels turning. It's not the sort of event that you can look at and say, well, maybe it's political, maybe it's not. Maybe he's thinking about this, maybe he's not. There is no question about it. For Jesus to ride into Jerusalem is to be political to make a political statement, to put himself in the place of conquerors and kings that have come before him. We call this the triumphal entry because it's a very king-like entry. It's a very political entry. And so speculation runs wild when Jesus enters. The, the passage we read says that when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus wants people to think politically. Jesus wants to get the political wheels turning. He doesn't want them to think that he's merely a philosopher building castles in the sky, that he's irrelevant to the day-to-day -day dealings of life. He wants them asking thoroughly political questions. Questions like, who is my king? Who is my Lord? Am I comfortable with the status quo? Or am I willing to entertain the idea? Am I willing to entertain the possibility of the kingdom of God, that God is somehow invested in the shape of our human politics? Why hasn't Jesus mobilized? Why hasn't he taken charge? Why hasn't Jesus rallied an army the way Judas Maccabeus did just 200 years ago? It's no coincidence that when Jesus came into Jerusalem, the people hailed him as the son of David. 
the son of David. In Mark's gospel, Jesus uh, is, is called the one who's, who is coming to bring the kingdom of David. A very political statement. Now, in doing this, Jesus is also setting the stage for what is to come. He's preparing us. Now, there are two ways, I think, to look at this. To look at Jesus' attitude toward this whole thing. And by this whole thing, I mean the week and the events that are to come. Namely, his suffering and his death. As Jesus enters, we might think that, that he has a very cavalier attitude about it. There's nothing to see here, folks. This is all part of the plan. I've got it all under control. This is all part of the plan. Now, this understanding is a little bit of a, I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek about it, but it's, it comes from the idea that God sent Jesus to die. God sent Jesus just to die. And if that's the case, then certainly that would be Jesus' attitude. He's entering Jerusalem because that's what he came here for. He came here in order to die, which completely undermines the life of Jesus. And in fact, I think it undermines his death. And it certainly undermines what we are going to celebrate next Sunday on Easter. The other way to look at this is that Jesus is thinking, you still don't see, but you will. You still don't understand. You're hailing me as king. And I know that when you say king, you're thinking of a human king. You're thinking of a king like Judas Maccabeus. You're thinking of a king who is coming in to, to change things, to turn things around, to, to kick the Romans out of Jerusalem, to make us an independent people. Jesus is thinking, you still don't see but you will. Jesus embraces the irony of this moment for Jesus to enter Jerusalem and to be hailed as a king, to have palm branches waved at him. Jesus is embracing the irony because he knows that, that the weak will lead to his suffering and death. There's a technique in teaching called cognitive dissonance where you set up the class or the listeners with, with their presumptions, their, 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 um, the, the assumptions that they bring to a subject. You, you feed those assumptions until they feel confirmed in those assumptions, and then you twist it. And then you show them that their assumptions are wrong. And you create cognitive dissonance, and that dissonance requires people to restructure their understanding. And Jesus is doing the very same thing all in a week's time. Jesus is coming in as king because he knows that people still think that that's what he came to do. No matter what he has said, no matter how many times he has told even his closest followers that this is not the kind of king he's come to be, he knows that people still expect that. And so he is creating for them this cognitive dissonance because the, the, the way that the weak is going to take shape is going to radically undermine people's expectations of who Jesus is and what he has come to do. This is why it's so important for us to remember Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, the night of Jesus' betrayal and, of course, the day of his suffering and his death. Because if we go from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, then we can call this day the day of the triumphal entry without, without a wink, without any sense of irony, without the sense of irony that the event really deserves because it's really not a triumphal entry. It's Jesus' march to his own defeat and death. And now I use that word defeat tongue-in-cheek as well because it looks for all the world like defeat. It looks to everyone watching like defeat. It even looks to the disciples like defeat because they run and hide in fear. This is the foolishness of the cross, as Paul likes to say. That the Messiah, the anointed one, the one sent from God would come and suffer and die. The week begins in triumph but ends in defeat. Jesus is showing the world the nature of God's power. The realm of politics, as he makes a political statement, is the realm of power. It's the realm of getting things done. Jesus, Jesus has people's imaginations going with this overtly political statement as they hail him as the son of David. Jesus had to be willing to carry his ministry to its logical conclusion. He had to be willing to continue until he suffered what inevitably he would suffer because of the way that he was confronting the religious and the political authorities. It was the only way, really, that Jesus could show the world the kind of love that God had sent him to show. The only way that he could show the depth of God's love was to suffer the way that he did and, of course, to die. 
he couldn't call it off at the last minute and say, you get the point yet? Can I, you know, can we, can we stop? Have you got it yet? He had to go all the way. It's as if to say, it's as if he is thinking, now that you're thinking politically, now that you have watched me enter as if I am a king, let me show you the true nature of power. Let me show you what human power does. And let me show you what God's power can do. The power of the cross, the power of Easter, the power of God is left-handed power. It's the sort of power that rides on a donkey instead of a mighty war horse. It's the sort of power that refuses to use violence. It's the sort of power that in its very dying breath offers forgiveness. We look back on that day knowing how the story ends. But we do well not to get too far ahead of ourselves. Today we shout Hosanna. Today we shout blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But on Friday we shout crucify him. And on Sunday... God gets the final word. Let us pray. God, we pray that as we journey through this week, that you would open our eyes to the nature of your love for us, that you would open our eyes to the nature of the sacrifice that Jesus endured in order to tell us who you are, how much you care for us, how much you've done for us, and what you desire for this world. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.